She is joined once again by Fiona Armstrong, a polymath, if you don't mind me saying so. Not only is she a, a scholar of German literature, she's a news presenter, a broadcaster, an author, an angler and a baker. What's all this baking business? Well, I'm not quite Mary Berry style, although my, I have to say my mother is probably as good as Mary Berry. She's fantastic. But um, my forte is really, not really baking, it's cooking. I mean, I love, I love making things like first courses, main courses. If you said to me, right, there's going to be a dinner party for 20 tonight, I say, wonderful, that's it. I'll do it. Excellent. Would you be good enough to prepare something for us to eat tomorrow so that we don't have to go to the ITV <laughs> canteen? Would you? I have seen him there. It was delicious. <laughs> oh, you old politician, you. <laughs> you old politician. Anyway, because, of course, you, you were brought up in Nigeria, I think. I was brought up in Nigeria, yes, as a child, and, uh, and went back uh, many years later to make some films with uh, ITV, so mm -hmm. it was quite interesting. I think I must have remembered the country to, through rose-tinted spectacles because when I went back, it was... Uh, was, wasn't quite as rosy as I remember. I bet. I, they went through troubled times, They of went through troubled times, yeah, they did yeah, indeed, yeah. yes. The great uh, insurrection. What was it called? Ajuku. What was it called? The Biafra. A Biafra was the mm. famine, yes, and mm. that, uh, that, that was uh, one of really the first uh, times that television had actually got in there with the starving children, mm. and you got these pictures. I think it was Michael Burke. Mm. And they got these starving pictures coming back from Biafra. Mm. Um, touched everybody's heartstrings. Terrible. Terrible. But now it's time to turn to, uh, to Fiona, the polymath. Which particular part of your life are you going to discuss with us now? Oh, right. Well, as Alison's here and she's from the Isle of Skye, I thought I'd talk about something Scottish to make everybody feel at mm. home. And, you know, there's a big debate going on at the moment about independence. Will or will Scotland go independence or will it not go independent? And I went to an event with my husband who, as we've already mentioned, is a Scottish clan chief and he was dressed in his kilt and all his tartan. So I put on my tartan suit and my tartan hat and I'm standing there just minding my own business, sipping my drink, and this lady came up to me and said, um, why are you wearing that outfit? And I said, well, um... I'm wearing it because I'm married to the clan chief over there and sort of pointed to my husband. She said, do you look like you're trying to make a statement, are you? And I said, no, not really, I'm just wearing it because I'm married to the clan chief. And she said, well, she said, I have to tell you, if you Scots want your independence, you can have it. We're sick of you in London, <laughs> and walked off. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm only, I'm only saying that to say that it really is becoming... Um, you know, sort of a slightly touchy argument, really. You know, well, we're a... not sick of you in London at all. Good. We love you in London. We love you in London. Tell me one thing. I understand that some a relative, a family member, um, was a literary confidant to Queen Victoria, and you're writing this up now. You're writing yes, a book that, about that it? that was on my husband's side. This lady was called Miss McGregor of McGregor. She was the tenth child of the then clan chief, mm. and in Victorian times she ended up working at the palaces for Queen Victoria as a sort of female John Brown, but well, sort of liaising with the Queen on all matters to do with Scotland, because the Queen loved Scotland, she mm. couldn't get enough of it. She had Balmoral up there, and she was happiest up there, particularly after her husband died, it was where she wanted to be. And this lady wrote books and uh, helped the Queen with her own writing, and the story's never been told, so that's what I'm working on at the moment. So, and that'll be published... Who knows? Hopefully well, next year. Next year. Good for you. Fiona? Well, I'm staying with the fishing theme. I got pike. Ah, well, um, you could actually put gar in front of it. I don't know if you've ever caught a gar pike. Uh, it is another word for the garfish, which is any number of long, slender fish with beak-like jaws and sharply pointed teeth. I shall go them. after one carefully <laughs> the next time I'm out. Yeah. Have you ever caught a pike? It's not your sort of fishing, really. I have it? been pike fishing. I've yeah? been pike fishing in Canada and Alaska. Absolutely fantastic because they're quite small pike there, they're not massive, but they have the most incredible take and you fish with these enormous lures that look like little teddy bears on the water or little furry mice on the water. And as soon as the pike comes up, it sees the, the lure on the water and it takes it and it goes down like a rocket. It's very exciting. And it's, they, they put up a fight? They fight like crazy. The little mm. pike fight much more strongly than the big fat enormous pike you find in some of the lochs and the lakes here. And they can give you a bite, literally a bite, can't I've they? I've never been bitten by a pike, but, you know, it's still yeah. time. We'll try and avoid it, Fiona. 